Hey, everybody. Hi, I'm Steve Lars Villier. I'm the president and founder of Stoked. Um, welcome to Stoked Conversations, um, a conversation about race and action sports. Um, we are super excited uh, to be here and to sort of have this conversation uh, at this time for the action sports industry. Um, so, why don't you go to the next slide? So, when we uh, came up with this um, idea, we realized that. Um, so, I actually, before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Stoke. Um, so, it was founded by myself and Salema Masakela. Um, uh, my background is I'm an entrepreneur um, in marketing. Um, Salema, uh, as most people know, I was a TV personality um, host for the X Games. And we had this vision to introduce. Uh, the culture and lifestyle of action sports to black and brown youth, people that look like us. We were very passionate about the lifestyle and uh, we wanted to introduce uh, low income, marginalized, underrepresented youth uh, to that field. Uh, you wanna go to the next slide? So our mission is to create a community of fearless leaders through mentoring, opportunity, and action. You wanna go to the next slide? And just to give you a little background on our youth, um, so 93% of our youth are uh, free or reduced lunch. Um, That's uh, a determination of their income level. 97% um, are, um, are BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color. 42% identify as female. And the reason why this is important is because action sports has historically seen low engagement from women in BIPOC. Um, and we view issues of diversity, equity, inclusion as inseparable from action sports, which is why we are hosting uh, this conversation at this time. You wanna go to the next slide? So just some of our programs, we have three major programs. Um, the first is a mentoring program where we match up youth with mentors uh, to give them social emotional support and to help steer them in uh, their success in after high school. Um, so we work with youth, uh, high school, middle and high school age youth. We also have an after school program that teaches life and career skills. Um, and then uh, our hallmark program is our action sports program where kids and mentors seasonally on the weekends, um, snowboard, skateboard and surf. So since 2005, we worked with 6,000 youth. We provide each of our youth 570 hours uh, of programming. And just for comparison's sake, if you look at a big brother, big sister type program, they provide 48 hours a year and we provide 570 hours. And so that's really uh, meant to address the, um, the widening income gap and the, uh, and the opportunity gap. Um, middle, class, uh, uh, middle class youth get significantly more hours of sports enrichment and after school programs more than low income youth. And so our aim is to really provide young people with um, everything that they need uh, to become successful after high school. Um, and also too, uh, for young people that, that uh, stick with our program for four years, we've had a 100% uh, high school graduation rate. Um, and then we've operated in three cities, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. So part of this conversation is a pledge. And so we don't want this to be another Zoom call where you just sit and listen to people talk. Um, we have been around for 15 years. We have a great track record. And if you are passionate about action sports, uh, we implore you to get involved and take a pledge at the end of this. We're building a community of diverse, inclusive, and passionate action sports enthusiasts that want to pave a more diverse pipeline for the future. And so this is your chance. And so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, Steph White, um, who's a key member of Stoked um, and has been really an internal driver on the diversity and equity conversation at Stoked. Um, and then I'm also, um, she's co-hosting, co-moderating with Salama Masakela, who's our co-founder um, and really been a big voice um, during these times on diversity and inclusion in action sports. So uh, off to you guys. Hi, Steph. Hey, everyone. 
Uh, Salema, do you want to intro yourself first? Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I am Salema Masakela. As Steve said, I am one of the co-founders um, of Stoked. And I'm excited that, that really that we have this opportunity to have this conversation uh, on Stoke's platform. And really, in the wake of everything that's taken place in the last two and a half months, um, especially in the wake of George Floyd, uh, the amount of conversations that are happening in uh, niche communities uh, across our landscape, uh, what's been awoken in, in the manner that people don't just want to have discussion, but that in the manner in which people want to do something, uh, really speaks to the amount of people that have shown up here today. So uh, we thank you uh, for that energy um, and hope that you'll uh, enjoy this very sort of interesting look uh, and perspective at a bunch of different um, people of color, black people, uh, with within this action sports community and landscape. Cool. Thanks, Lemma. And a super quick intro on me. Uh, my name is Steph, and I work with Stoked Mentoring. I've been a part of Stoked since 2016 in all different sort of capacities. Um, I live in LA, born in Miami, grew up in Brazil, so whatever that is. Um, skated and surfed throughout my life, but actually the first time I ever saw snow was with a Stoked snowboarding trip. <coughs> Um, with our kids. So that was a special moment for me. I don't want to get too much into my introduction. Um, but I do want to say a couple of things before we get started. Again, I really appreciate everyone for being patient with the technical difficulties um, of creating such a big movement of so much interest and so much involvement. So I really appreciate that. Um, and before we get this conversation started, I just want to remind everyone to enter this conversation and enter this space from a place of growth. So in action sports, the epitome of action sports is being someone who's brave and a risk taker and someone who's humble and who is expecting to fall and expecting to just be endlessly resilient. And so I really hope that you guys take those traits that you have and love from your sport, whatever your action sport is, and channel them into this conversation and any conversation you guys have about race. Uh, Salama, do you wanna add anything to that before we say a couple more things and get to the panel? No, I think uh, I think you put it absolutely perfectly. Thanks. <laughs> um, OK, so a couple of things that Salam and I spoke about um, that I think are worth mentioning before we get started also is that um, in all honesty, the title of this webinar being a webinar about race and action sports is misleading. Well, it's not misleading, but it's maybe a little bit overly ambitious. I just want to emphasize that in order to to get to a place where we're truly uh, racially equitable and inclusive, you, it's it's a conversation we have to have endlessly. It's a conversation that's lifelong and there's nothing I can tell you or Salama can tell you or anyone can tell you that will fix racism or will solve any of these problems in one go. It's really a conversation. And I think um, some of the most incredible things about all of our panelists is that they have been on this lifelong journey to, to learn and to share and to grow um, this information. Uh, Salema, do you want to talk maybe for a second about what directions we are intending to go with this conversation to just take a tiny stab at cracking open the surface of this conversation on race and action sports? Yeah, I mean, I think what you said um, makes perfect sense. You know, the history of race and action sports is a very huge landscape, um, and that's not all going to be covered uh, today. But it is an opportunity, I think, for people to really gain some perspective in what um, the experience is like for those who find themselves as others or in a lot of cases uh, the only person uh, who looks like them within their field um, and what this what that experience might look like i think that our the culture of our sports are so about feeling good and so about connectivity and so so about uh, engaging with the environment and have just this endless well of positive vibes that it's very, very difficult for people to, to even comprehend um, that we are challenged by the race conversation within action sports. I have so many people uh, who over the years and especially uh, in, in, in the wake of what's been going on um, with this awareness about, about race um, saying, well, that can't possibly uh, apply to us or that I don't really have to be in that conversation because I don't see color. Um, and what that really says is no matter what it is that you're telling me that you experience, uh, it can't possibly be true because I just don't see it that way. 
And to Steph's point, if that's going to be sort of the barrier for people to want to understand and comprehend uh, and, and even allow themselves to, to, to admit the ways in, in which they perhaps have been participating without knowing, then we don't move forward. If you came to this panel with a mindset of like, well, I'm going to learn a couple of things that are going to help me fix this thing. Um, this is the wrong discussion. This isn't something that gets fixed. This isn't something that you get a couple of tools and suddenly like, ah, oh, I don't, I, it's no longer an issue. This is about um, really trying to formulate ways and, and learn from other people's experiences so that you can make this a part of doing the work in who you are for the duration of your existence, just like anything else that you practice. Um, at being great in, in life. And in turn, uh, if, if, if it becomes a personal choice, then you are able to affect the worlds around you, which is friends, family, um, and in, this, in, in, in the, the context of this discussion, um, our industry, making a difference within the DNA of your brands uh, to make being anti-racist um, and, and being inclusive a part of the culture of how we live and how you do business. Thanks, Salama. Um, and on on that also, last thing I want to acknowledge before we get started was is without throwing shade, is how difficult honestly it was to find people in the action sports industry who are not black and are speaking up about racism in their communities. So we have an incredible, phenomenal, amazing panel today of people with limitless wealth of information and insight and resources. Um, but I do want to recognize that it's not black people's job to teach non-black people how to treat them better. Um, actually, Salema, on your podcast, shameless plug, What Shapes This Podcast, um, I actually remember Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson make, making a comment about, um, imagine what black people would accomplish if they didn't spend so much of their time defending their right to live. And that I thought was such a powerful point of, the, so many of the panelists you'll see today are people who are able to overcome so many barriers that we see every day and things that we've never noticed as a white person, as non-Black people. And they were able to overcome that and excel in their sport or in their, their fields and in this industry. And I really want to acknowledge that and really highlight the speakers we do have today that, that did amplify the voices of the Black and Brown communities in, in this movement and in, in their lives as a whole. Um, yeah. Go for it. No, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. Um, I think uh, for a lot of times people, prior to what this situation that we've been in where we have this sort of heightened awareness, I think it was really easy for people to, to have sympathy, right? Like, oh, I feel bad that um, these black people um, or indigenous people um, or people identifying within the LGBTQ plus community that these people are going through this thing, but feeling bad, it almost felt like they were doing enough, like they were doing the work. This is, a, th what we're talking about is empathy. Empathy being the ability to listen, learn about how people experience life and in turn want to do something. Being, being, being filled with the necessity to feel like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to take some action. And I'm going to figure out what I have access to um, to make a difference. And to your point about it being difficult um, to find non non black people, white people within the industry that are being vocal. You know, I was standing on the water's edge with one of the best surfers in the world, um, maybe about three or four weeks ago, talking about inclusion um, and and in the surf industry. And this person looked me dead in the eye as we we're about to paddle out and said. Well, it's not really the surf industry's responsibility um, to play a role in expanding the landscape. Like those people need to come up in the same way that I did, because frankly, you know, it's just not part of black culture um, to be a surfer. Don't you think? Oof. And, and I, I was sitting there slack jawed as we were about to go paddle out and do this thing um, that I, I love so much that makes me a part of who I am that this person was unwilling to comprehend the years and years and years of systemic uh, racism via segregation, et cetera, that have prevented people of color from taking, from, from having the opportunity to even look at these outdoor spaces as something that they have access to. Like that, that, that it was designed to be that way. 
And so the person thought that they were making a public service announcement to me to be like, well, it's, you know, you're unique. You're a different kind of black guy. You're more like me. Um, but to, to think that we're responsible for the rest of you, I mean, it's just not a part of, of who you people are. And those are those unconscious, deep-seated biases that people have at all different levels that we are, it, is, it should be our goal to break away. And it takes work and it takes time, but that's what we are, that's what we're dealing with um, when, when I think of, of sort of the landscape uh, of, of action sports and why we have so much work to do. Yeah, and and I do I do want to acknowledge too I not to to for not to to excuse something like that, but also that so many people have never had have had like the amazing privilege to never really have to think about that, and so a mindset like that is not okay, but it, but makes total sense if you've never had these conversations and these questions. And I think that now what's really exciting is if you have never done that before, like now is your time. Like that's not okay. Like now. Um, do the research, attend events like this, um, read some books, learn, like talk to your friends who are willing to have these conversations with you um, and really make that happen. And as Salama, you and I have talked about this a gazillion times that the more diverse a space is truly in, in race, gender, age, the more diverse a space is wholly, the more infinitely interesting and rich those conversations and those experiences can be because you're coming from all these different perspectives and all these different angles. And so, I'm really excited to, today to sort of get those perspectives from different industries and different people from so many different um, backgrounds and races and walks of life to share this experience. Um, I also wanna say one thing really quick before we get started on the panels, um, is just that it, throughout this webinar, if, there, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you like to quote, Salema is extremely quotable, um, and so is our whole panel, if you have um, anything that you'd like to share, if you would like to use the hashtag stoked pledge on the bottom there and um, tag stoked org so we can continue these conversations online beyond this. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more later too. Um, Salama, if you have any last things to say, go for it. If not, we can start introing the first panel. Um, thank you, Steph. Um, I, the last thing I would say is that, you know, I started in this industry um, because I got a shot to answer the phones at uh, Transult Snowboarding Magazine in 1993. And for about 15 years in my journey through this industry, I think I, I really dealt with maybe three or four people that look like me across the landscape of surfing uh, and snowboarding. And so to, to be able to be on this, on, on this call, you know, 20 some odd years later um, in, in, in in this sort of landscape, having this big of a conversation, um, it really is a dream come true because it is, it is my hope, you know, uh, before I introduce uh, our panelists, it is my hope that in my lifetime, these are panels that we do not need to have, that this is not um, something that we're needing to discuss, that the, 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 a beautiful landscape of lots of different people and different types of stories um, is just something that is normal and that we've learned to celebrate and that we've seen um, has come to really enrich the totality of our landscape and really help it survive and thrive uh, and grow. So as happy as I am to be here, this is not what I want to be doing. Um, with my Thursday. And I don't think any of our panelists uh, really feel like they wake up in the morning and be like, I can't wait to talk about some race stuff today. This is what I live for. Um, as much as we're excited to tell and happy to tell our stories and to share, please understand like it's not, this is not literally something that um, people wake up in the morning and hope to do. You, there is gratification in the work as we see people's minds um, and hearts starting to shift. Um, but it should be all of our goals to make it so that, like, remember when we used to have Zoom calls and big, big, big tentpole conversations about this? God, that feels like 10,000 years ago. That's really um, what what I think our, our, our goal is here. And again, thank you to all of you for showing up. Um, and I'm going to stop flapping my gums and <laughs> invite some other people to, to, to help me uh, as well. Thank you, Steph, uh, for the beautiful setup and intro. And uh, I would like to introduce our esteemed panel coming to us from across uh, the globe. 
all stars, uh, basically. First up uh, is the one and only Michael Laren. This guy is a, a human ATV when it comes uh, to, to BMX riding. Uh, can ride absolutely anything. Had the privilege of, of meeting him for the first time physically um, at Woodward in Utah, and it was an instant connection. And really excited to hear his story on this panel. Next up uh, is Greg Hatton. Uh, he is uh, an, an only, if you will, in a very interesting landscape uh, of motorsports. Uh, has worked all throughout uh, the motorsports industry, uh, especially in motocross, uh, for decades. Uh, a big part of, uh, of, of Bubba Stewart's career. And it'll be really interesting uh, to get to know him and hear some of his experiences as well. Elena Height. I have had the privilege of knowing this young lady for some reason, um, I can say 13 or 14 years old. Um, she has always ridden with the power of, of someone much bigger uh, than her physical stature. She is a, a passionate rider and uh, of all terrain who's really like taking things next level in the backcountry after years and years of uh, competing elite competition uh, in half pipe and super pipe. And one of the, the, the lone non-black voices within the action sports community who is not afraid uh, to risk uh, her, her, her human capital, her followers, uh, to really speak out uh, on issues that she believes um, affect us all, including Black Lives Matter. And really, really grateful uh, to Elena for taking some time um, from digging out in, uh, in Wyoming right now uh, to be with us in this convo. And last but not least, um, Mr. Michael February, MFeb, who's coming to us all the way from South Africa after five days of, of getting himself barreled senseless at Jeffreys Bay. Um, he is drying his gills out in this conversation. Um, the first non-black South African uh, to, to make it onto the WSL World Tour. Um, and really, Mikey has is has become probably reluctantly uh, an ambassador for this larger conversation of what uh, inclusion and diversity uh, means in in the sport of surfing, and also with a unique perspective, having grown up in the wake of uh, the apartheid government and system to to actually make his way into this uh, this journey. Mikey is enjoying a beautiful run uh, in a head to toe sponsorship with Vans that's allowing him to go around the world uh, and really storytell. Um, surfing and show people what this sort of larger landscape of surfing uh, really means when we look at, at, at global surf culture. And we are very, very grateful to Mikey uh, for joining us. And with that, I will welcome in all of the homies. It looks like a game show. Uh, <laughs> with, uh, with, with me at the center. Uh, thank you all. Um, for joining us, it, it really means a lot to have such a an interesting, uh, diverse group of humans from across these different sports. Um, right off the bat, I just want to get a little bit of sort of personal reference uh, as to your experiences, uh, without having to go full full bio. Greg, I'm going to start with you. Um, what's it been like for for you in your journey? How did you get into the sports? No nah, man, I, you started, are? I started off. I mean, as a kid, really, I went to drag races with my best friend at the time. His name was Brett Walker. And um, his father was a drag racer, and we would always go to Pomona. And that just lit me on fire, seeing these big cars, these loud engines, you know what I mean? And I, I was kind of blown away with it. And that sent me down the path to, you know, kind of just learn more about cars and learn more about racing in general. And, um, you know, to fast forward through it, I started learning about autocross. I started learning about NASCAR. I started learning about Formula One. Then there was motorcycles. And then there was this, there was that, and then there was design. So in college, I got involved with the race shop in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, run by my boy, Sean Torrente, who's actually a world champion um, boat racer now. It's amazing. Um, but I started working with him, went all around the country doing drag racing. Then that sent me to uh, work with this other shop, and that sent me to work with Falcon Tire Corporation. Shout out to Nick and the guys. And then after that, I just got into motorcycles, worked with Alpine Stars for years, 
best amazing experiences. We can get into that. And then um, that also led me to meet James Stewart. And um, I love that dude. And, you know, I just, it, it's been a wild ride. It's been international. And I mean, I, I've taken a lot of it with me, um, but it wasn't easy. I'll tell you that. Mm. Michael. Yeah, I think uh, when I was younger, it was just one of those things that uh, it, it was in my family already. Um, my mom was uh, very into skateboarding at the time. And growing up in Wisconsin, there wasn't like a ton of action sports that I knew of yet. Um, and then as I got older, it became more of a thing. And uh, right around 95, X Games came out and all that stuff. And at that time, we had only been riding BMX dirt. So we really didn't know much about park at that time. Um, soon following after that, they built our home skate park and then off to the races, man. It was such an amazing experience. Um, I had an older brother that I was trying to keep up with. And um, I just remember making a statement when I was younger. I was like, I'm gonna do that one day. And I remember watching like it was Mira Robinson, uh, Hoffman and all those guys. And there was just something about it. There's such an allure to watching them do their thing. And I just understood the creative process at a young age that you could, you know, become like the, the, the Van Gogh of your, your mind and just be able to kind of paint brush strokes in a skate park, if you will. And, uh, and that just became so addicting to me that I just kept running after it. So, um, through the years, it was just one of those things, um, you know, same as Greg was just saying, where, you know, you, you put so much into it, and it's not it's not an easy grab but at the same point in time it's one of those things that it's worth it the whole way through and um for me to be sitting here today like i pinch myself constantly just to think about all the memories and character building and ups and downs and ebbs and flows and all that stuff so um so for me it's just one of those things like gratitude's at at the peak of it and uh i'm just i'm man for it man so uh yeah Bars, first quotable, oh. become the Van Gogh of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I need the t-shirt. <laughs> that, that, uh, that was powerful. And then when you said that, it, it gave me chills because that's really um, what, what, what the level of self-expression is um, mm. in all of these. And, you know, uh, I'll just throw it over to a, to a painter uh, who's got a, a big, big, big bag of a big palette of colors uh, and paintbrushes in 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 Michael February, um, Mr. February. How did how did surfing um, become your love, my brother? Yeah, so I mean, I grew up in Cape Town, South Africa, and yeah, I didn't really come from a family that was um, you know has the crazy surf history or anything. I mean, back then, I know um, there weren't too many surfers of color, and yeah, my dad. I mean, being the unique cool human that he is he you know just decided that it was something that he was you know enjoyed and wanted to you know start doing and um you know when I grew up and I was around maybe seven or eight he introduced me to surfing and you know I kind of just wanted to do what he did and um yeah just you know from there just fell in love with the ocean and what it had to offer and you know surfing and just the whole experience and um yeah i just got completely obsessed with it and started competing and um yeah i just couldn't couldn't get away from it really and um over time you know started competing and just kind of wanted to make it a thing that i could do every single day and um you know fortunately um you know things went really well and uh i competed on the world qualifying tour which is obviously the tour that you compete on to, you know, make the big leagues, which is the, um, the world tour, which is the top 34. And yeah, finally, after many, many years of trying to reach that goal of mine and, um, which is quite amazing and just really fulfilling. And, um, yeah, I'm super lucky now. I've been, um, a part of the band Vans family for quite a long time now and just been blessed to be able to travel the world world and, um, just surf and uh, try and spread as much stoke as possible. Yeah. Um, it was when when you came on 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 onto the world tour, were you, were you ready for or did you expect uh, the amount of conversation uh, that came with it as this the the, the first African indigenous sort of Af African surfer to make the world tour? Um, what what was it like being sort of on the outside looking in at yourself as this was the lens that you were seeing? 
Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, to be honest, growing up, you know, going way back, obviously, like looking at someone like my dad and, you know, just him giving me all the opportunity in the world and, and supporting me and with surfing, I, I didn't really look at, I didn't really look at race much. And, you know, I was just obsessed with this thing that was surfing and it's all I wanted to do. I didn't really care about anything else. And obviously growing up and becoming a little bit more educated and a little bit more aware of things. And it obviously was, obviously when you reach the world tour, there's a lot more, um, a lot more people, a lot more eyes and a lot more, I guess, conversations. But um, yeah, it was wild. I mean, of course there's obviously, you know, uh, other people of color like Brazilians and things like that. But I think it was only then that I realized that, I mean, if you look at, even just South Africa and how, you know, few surfers of color they are, or even just the rest of the world. Um, it was quite, quite a thing, you know, obviously reaching that stage, but then, you know, kind of getting into that conversation and, and just realizing, you know, where the sport was in that sense. Um, and yeah, it was quite a, I mean, a bit of a shock, but also just, yeah, something that, uh, I guess needed to be worked, worked on and spoke about and, um, it was just a crazy feeling, I guess, reaching that point. What were some of the challenges that you're, you, you know, you, uh, to put into perspective, surfing in South Africa was, was something that for a long time, black people, um, colored people in South Africa could not participate in uh, legally at, at most beaches in South Africa until about the, the 90s. What were the specific sort of experiences that your father dealt with in choosing to be like, whatever, F this? Um, I'm, I'm doing this thing. Yeah. I mean, I think he was just, he, I mean, he was always one person. He, he loves, loves to be different. He never wants to be the same as everyone else. Um, and I think during that time, it obviously took a person that wasn't a, afraid to be different because I mean, if you, you know, had to look at, you know, just the image of, you know, people in the water, there was, and also the fact that, you know, there was only a few beaches that he could really go to it was and those were and those beaches weren't exactly the best waves that we had you know it was only a select few um and yeah it's i mean i didn't even realize it but just i guess the courage that he had to you know just be himself and you know take on something new that wasn't really you know recognized in his community um or he i mean he didn't even have you know more people that were well, like I'm doing that. So, um, I, you know, to have that courage and um, to be able to pass that on to, you know, someone like myself is is such a blessing because I probably wouldn't have started surfing if it wasn't for him. Um, and I think, I don't know, I feel like that's, you know, what's missing is, you know, just having those examples. Well, I'm missing, but I feel like that's the important thing to look at is having those examples that, you know, people from the community can you see people who look like them. I mean, I get, you know, these messages every now and again, and these people are like, you know, it's just, it's so cool to see someone who looks like you, you know, doing something that, you know, not many people like us do. And like, it, it's encouraging. Um, and I think that's something that just needs to be um, just encouraged a lot more. Mm. Representation uh is is really everything i mean when i first started uh surfing in the late 80s early 90s kids did not have a problem coming up to me t telling me that you know you guys don't know how to swim so what are you even doing here? and it would be years before i saw any representation i saw a small picture in the back of surfer magazine in like 1991 of a guy named cab spates and the picture was so small that my friends fought me because when i said i think that guy's black and they're like, no, it's just, you know, it's just a dark black and white picture. And I cut, once I finally learned that he actually was a, a, a black pro surfer from Virginia Beach, I cut out this small little photo that was this big and I put it on my wall. Um, and I just, for me, that might, it might as well have been the cover of Surfer Magazine because it meant that I wasn't crazy that I thought um, that, I could, that I could do this thing. And um, what you... I think unknowingly have done and, and, and become a representative of as far as that representation representation is concerned uh, is going is going to, is helping to change the world as little kids see like, oh, I want to dance like Michael February does on a, on a surfboard. I can do that. Elena, um, 
I, I feel like you've had a lens into some of the texture of what these experiences are as a woman coming up in a very, very white male, hyper masculine world of, of snowboarding. A little bit of what your experiences uh, were like and if, and if you can make the connection to sort of what's made you choose to become this person who's like, no, I'm, I'm not gonna sit on the sidelines. I'm, I'm going to use my voice and my platform to, to speak to these issues. Um, yeah, I think that, I don't wanna say that I can relate to these experiences because I know it's just quite different, but as a woman in action sports, I think that we inherently face some sort of discrimination or questioning of, you know, um, what you're doing in certain areas and if you can keep up. And, and so I can definitely relate to the disheartening that that causes. Um, <laughs> and I agree with what Mikey is saying about um, just having representation. I mean, I know that seeing other women snowboard when I was a kid was rare and having that is what, you know, helped me want to do what I did. Um, and I think as far as speaking up now, especially in this time when um, so much, this conversation is coming to light in such a way that I think that I've always known it was there, um, but I grew up in a small, mountain town um, that was extremely white. Uh, I think that I knew one black kid in my entire like history of growing up until I left my town when I started snowboarding professionally. And even then, I mean, we go to these mountain towns all over the world that are predominantly white and um, secluded. And snowboarding is a very, you know, niche sport and so for me when this conversation of race and inequality and um, just really diversity came more to the forefront it's just a no-brainer for me I mean I think that we're also lucky to have this sport that brings people who really maybe don't go with the status quo um, together and we need that flavor and the diversity in our in our sports it's what is going to continue to keep um them flourishing hmm. well first of all I, I i mean i salute you for choosing to use your pri privilege in the manner that you have to speak out what has it been like um What's it like when you get the backlash from uh, your followers? who are like, I can't believe you, Elena. I've always respected you and, you know, stick to snowboarding. Why are you talking about this stuff? You're bringing me down. Yeah, the uh, stay in your lane conversation is funny. I had a couple arguments about that. Um, it's tough. You know, I think that we're living in a really uh, interesting time where everyone has a voice, which is amazing. Um, but there's no responsibility with that voice oftentimes um, through the internet and through social media. And so people say things that they wouldn't say to you in person or that don't necessarily have any substance. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I just try to separate myself from the screen and know that I'm doing the best that I can to learn about how to make this world a better place and um, the people who don't agree with me can go elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> you can insert, insert any number of uh, colorful adjectives uh, for, for elsewhere uh, there, folks. Greg, <laughs> uh, when, when, when we started, you, you said at the end of your statement about your journey, you said it's been hard um, and there have been challenges. What, 
what has it been like to be, what is it like to be an only in that kind of world in the motorsport, in motorsports, which inherently has far more sort of traditional racist roots uh, in where it emanates from? Yeah, I mean, I really think that we need to understand the connection between a lot of the different issues that we're talking about. And <clears throat> racism just in the streets is the same as racism in the office is the same as racism in the parks, at the beaches, and in industries, really. And, you know, there was, you're gonna, you know, as I came up, and as a lot of the other friends that I know that came up, and I'm pretty sure everybody on this panel has, has experienced this, but there's been times where you're just not seen, you know, and they just don't even know that you're there, or that you're just a cog in the wheel, no personality. You know, you might, no matter how long you've been working there, you might get passed over for a job. And you have all the experience, you have all the connections, you might have that. And, and it's the same thing that happens. So, you know, there's a, there's a trope that's been kind of passed down through generations in African-American culture where you just had to kind of suck it up to achieve what you want to achieve, especially if you believe you can do it. And back in the day, I think we spoke about it yesterday, Justin, um, who you'll speak with later, uh, you know, mentioning that we had to walk on eggshells a lot of the time. You couldn't say what you wanted to say or be who you really were. Or, you know, I couldn't turn on Nipsey Hussle in the, mis in the middle of the office, even though I'm working, because it might scare everybody. You know what I mean? But they don't even know why I would want to listen to that and listen to the message that he was trying to give. You know what I mean? So mm. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that it was hard to stomach because you couldn't be free basically. And that shows up in a lot of different ways. And, you know, I, I, I remember wanting to be in part of conversations because I had different knowledges of a various racing organization or just because of the stuff that I studied, but I was just completely like denied it. And it sucked. But I understood at that time, like, yeah, well, they're not seeing me as a as a way to get that information or maybe they don't want me to be in that place so whatever i'm gonna do something else i still got to make this phone call over here to xyz team writer whoever and that's awesome so i just kind of like navigated it as best as possible but there there has been struggles i mean you know to i mean i don't want to get too heavy right off the bat but um, and not knowing how to communicate your own feelings to the people that are around you the most while you're doing what you want to do is that in itself is, is stifling. You know, that in itself, it, it makes you kind of shell up a little bit to try to, you know, try to find a way through your own emotions because nobody else understands it. And, and an example for that is um, in 2008, I was working at Alpine Stars and I had some amazing experiences at that company, um, just meeting a lot of people that I never thought that I would meet. Like just, you know what I mean? Racers and team directors, seeing cars that I never thought I'd see and motorcycles that I never thought I'd see. Um, just being a black kid from LA, it was like really untouched or out of, out of reach, but somehow I made my way in there. And, and that year I was working with the, um, with Alpine Stars on, and my duty was the Red Bull Rookies Cup. And in the Red Bull Rookies Cup, we had all these kids that were trying to be the next, you know, MotoGP racer, American Superbike or World Superbike racer. KTM and, Al and K KTM, Alpine Stars and Red Bull partnered up to give these good kids like a full factory bike, full factory team, all this support. And we got to tour with the AMA circuit. It was awesome lifelong friends made and all that kind of stuff. But there was one kid in particular that I loved and I didn't really know how to show a lot of that love because it, it, I didn't want it to be like stereotypical, you know, like I was trying to be there for all the kids, but um, the kid was Toriano Wilson. And if you guys are in the industry, you might know the story, but Toriano Wilson died on the racetrack uh, in Virginia, VIR, and we were at the race and he's, he was always one of the fastest, but he would always like make a mistake or there'd be a crash or something like that. 
And it sucked because I knew how much potential the kid had, but I also saw how hard he was pushing just to be considered. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like he was pushing, mm. pushing, pushing. Mm. And he was fast. And he was just mm. the only black kid there, right? So anyways, the morning that he died, um, he was having a pretty good day on Saturday, qualified really kind of all right. But Toriano into the warm up, he was the fastest and he was floating, dude. It was sick. I was like, look at this kid go. And he was stoked about it. He felt it. And so I'm I'm proud on the inside because I see somebody that I wish I had the opportunity to, but I'm, I'm going to help him up if possible. Anyway, before the race got started, we're, we're getting ready. The kids are getting suited up. We have the, the big trailer. We got the awning. We got all these bikes. And Toriano is just like jamming. He's got his headphones on. He's feeling it. He's feeling it. And he came up to me. He's like, Greg, Greg, listen to this. Listen to this. I know you like it. He said, I know you like it. I listened to it. It was Black Star, Brown Skin Lady. Mm. And I was like, what? Like, this kid just threw out Black Star, Brown Skin Lady. We're in Virginia. The race started. And when the race started, you know, like we're all watching, but in the first lap, there was an incident. One of the kids didn't get a good start. He went down, the, all, everybody else went down the track and he slid out and it was like a little chicane. So he went through the dirt and made a whole big cloud of dust. But the kid that had a bad start came late. And as he was coming up to where that dust cloud was, he was just like, all right, well, like, you know, the dust clouds over the whole track and he just kind of went in. On the other side of that, we all had the camera feed and Toriano was standing up because he slid out in the middle of the track and he got hit mm. right there. Mm. As soon as he like, as soon as he got hit by the bike, you just saw it was just over. And I was heartbroken. Like I, I couldn't even, I don't even know how the feelings, I don't even know what I looked like. And everybody was pretty upset as well. But, you know, it kind of hit me pretty hard and it, it hit the industry pretty hard. But I bring that story up to say that it is difficult. And before he passed away, like I'm gonna end it here, before he passed away, there was a situation where um, we were working with the kids and we were at some racetrack and one of the guys that I work with in the paddock, white guy, of course, Toriano's fast and all that, there's all these other kids. And he said to me, and I can't, I remember this, he was like, yeah, he's cool, he's fast. But you got to admit, he does have really big lips. And I was like, I was like, yo, like, why do you think you can say that to me? You know what I mean? Like, and I was so shook that I didn't really know what to do in, in the moment. But that statement, I was like, this is like, you know, we all know the stereotypes. We all know, like, all this, this <clears throat> baited wordage that's been used against black people and to choose that like it, it almost felt like he was itching to say that mm. and it it stuck with me for for years and then you know fast forward to the point that toriano dies and you know it sucks and all that kind of stuff but those types of things make it so hard because inherently motorsports is is not really inclusive it's good a good old boy sport especially when you get into dirt bikes you know like running around with james stewart you know we saw it everywhere this is a he's a legend of the sport living legend of the sport and he's still dealing with people like there was a race you know they always complain about him crashing and all this kind of stuff I'm like this dude's trying to be the best ever you know what I'm saying? And if you want to be honest and no disrespect to the homie, but Travis Pastrana crashes all the time too. No disrespect, mm. but both of those two guys are trying to do what they love, what they know and how to go after it. But in one situation, we have a race at Anaheim. James is feeling it, walking to the starting gate. He's walking with his dad's dad's pumping him up right behind him. In Anaheim, California, you got somebody yelling at, him, uh, yelling at him, calling him a nigger, throws like a beer, hits his dad as they're lining up to race. So ask yourself, what what legend of any sport has the pressures to perform in the given sport? And motocross and supercross is, in my opinion, the hardest thing that the human body can do. You know what I mean? 
Um, mm. It's just taxing on the body. But all those pressures, and then to deal with the social pressures and the, and the like, oh, or you're this, you're that, and you're that, like that, it's unfair. It's very unfair. And we have to really be aware of, of those realities because that's what makes it hard to do the things that you want to do in life as a black man, yeah. as a black woman, as a minority, as a person of color, whatever it is, like there's things that are happening in the social construct and fabric of this country that makes it very difficult to just be who you, be. Who you are. Just, yeah. just to be. Just to I be. appreciate those, those, those stories, Greg. Um, and, and it's the reason why we could have this conversation literally for two hours because everyone has, it just puts it in, into such context. Um, Rest in peace, Toriano, and and just to hear that about uh, about Bubba is 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 crazy, you know. And and you make a very interesting distinction between Travis being celebrated for that go get it attitude when he crashed, and the opposite uh, for Bubba. Michael, I know that and we don't have a lot of time left, but I know that for you in the come up, you've had your challenges. But one of the interesting things is that you, that you mentioned is that. In, in your come up, when you try to have these conversations about what your experiences are, you get a reaction um, from your peers where they basically try to like gaslight you by telling you that you're playing some sort of a race card uh, instead of hearing what your perspective is. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a tough one too because we, we can have the conversation about um, just, I guess when it comes down to it, there's a, there's a line that's drawn where, um, they see you as an articulate person. They see you as this person that means well. And to have this this lighthearted approach to our craft, like um, I think sometimes you get mislabeled a little bit and um, they see where I come from, but they don't understand maybe sometimes what it took or required for me to get where I'm at, you know? And those stories, as soon as you start sharing them, some people are uncomfortable, you know? Um, they, they might not understand what it was like growing up on food stamps. They might not understand what it was like, you know, sharing rooms with family, what it was like um, having to throttle the electricity, um, not running the heat during the winter, C certain things like that, you know, and it's not a, a woe was me thing. It's a survival thing, you know? So um, as soon as race gets brought up, it's, <laughs> it's, there's a few instances that kind of stand out in my, in my head and I'll be quick with it. Um, there was a couple situations where I had people say, well, you're not that black. Mm. <laughs> like, what what does that mean? You know what I mean? So hey, we all know that one. Yo, and it's it's just one of those things like, oh, you know, you're so articulate. And it's like, oh, okay, so you black speak, people. You speak so well. Exactly. Thank you. And that's one of those things where it, it always grinds my gears because I'm like, what does that even mean? And then uh, in addition to that, oh, well, so-and-so is blacker than you are and they're white. You know, they're saying a white person's blacker than I am because what? Oh, man. You know, he, he smokes weed and drinks 40s, like verbatim. And that's one of those things where I, it just blows my mind to see that kind of candor with certain people. And it just, like I said, it grinds my gears. But it's one of those things where if we could actually sit down and try to have, you know, a conversation even like this, people, people start to wake up a little bit to it. And some people are so oblivious or unconscious of some of the stuff that they're saying. And it's the same thing with the guy, uh, Greg, that you're talking about, um, about Toriano's lips. And it's like, what, what would project somebody to say that in their head, let alone out verbally. Right. So it's just one of those things where um, I think it's always there. Um, some people are more. Oh, I think we just lost Michael. Um, uh, there he is. Okay. People are more verbal than others, but I think it's one of those contract uh, constructs that we can slowly dismantle and, uh, it's just, I don't know, it's it's tough to tackle sometimes, but it's just one of those things like when it's in your face, it's in your face. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, the other part where you are starting to receive your accolades and making your way up and more than a few people will tell you with a smile that, well, you know, you're only in this position or getting these things happening to you um, because you're black. Uh, and Man. you wouldn't get these opportunities if it was otherwise, which everyone um, has experienced. Somehow or another, we have eclipsed our, our 30 minutes, but I'm gonna give everybody uh, 30 seconds to sort of give their sort of summation of, 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 of what they think the future uh, can look like. What are, you, what, 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 are you, what are you hyped on about the potential of, of this moment? 
I'll start with you, Greg, and keep it sh respectfully short. Yeah. No, I mean, I think we have the chance to kind of write a new story and really like hold people's feet to the fire and make people understand how, how the world really works because we're really all connected and we need to be that way to go forward. I mean, it's better when you got somebody that can bring you some authentic Mexican food. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's so dope that way. But I mean, we got to be aware of what inspiration really is um, and understand that it's not really, um, it's not reserved for the people that we just, the only the people that we want to give it to because it's going to hit everybody. I mean, I was inspired by Salema. I was inspired by you the first time I saw you on X Games, I didn't know anything about you. I was like, this black dude is doing this in front of all these white people. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Like that, that lit me on fire and I've been following you ever since. But inspiration, like a lot of times companies get so pigeonholed into thinking this is how we have to be and not understanding that there's somebody in the hood. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, just from my side, you know, I do think that, you know, what is important is just, you know, having that representation. But I think just giving, you know, like we're talking about, you know, there's, you know, the, in communities, there's things that people do that aren't the norm and not the, you know, what everyone else does there. But I think it's just important that, you know, going forward that we give give people in communities that you know surfing or skating or any action sports is is not the norm is just giving them the opportunity because i'm sure we all know that you know what all our different sports gives us is it's more than just like a career or like a competitive sport it's actually just gives us happiness and i think to you know expand and make it more inclusive is small things like you know giving people the opportunity and giving people other people to look at as inspiration and um, um, you know someone to kind of like lead them. Um, yeah. So it's just just about you know whether it's giving a surfboard or a skateboard or just trying to expand it and make it more inclusive. I think that's I think moving forward that's you know what people need to do. And I think it's a long term thing. It's not it's not just a thing that we should be talking about now, but something that you might only see the effects and the you know in the long term, but I promise you it'll be, you know, um, all for the better. So, Yeah, it's going to definitely expand the, the landscape and, and preserve uh, and, and, and grow uh, this industry. Um, we lost Elena Height because she's in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which has notoriously horrible um, Wi-Fi despite having great mountains. Uh, so we're grateful to her for uh, her perspective. Michael, thank you so much. Um, get your last thoughts. Yeah, I just I feel like all of us collectively, um, if we continue to just stay the course and remain authentic, um, having these conversations isn't easy, um, you know, but ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. So I'm always with it, man. I think that a lot of these um, people that are on the other end of this conversation, um, you know, are, are, are going to gain something just from experiences. And I think as a human people like we um, all can benefit from one another's experiences. So. Um, you know, as we move forward with this industry, um, kind of back to what you were saying in the beginning, where this technology is uh, can either hurt us or help us. And if we can kind of keep pulling these efforts together, um, it ends up, I feel like it'll end up being something that raises awareness, not only that, but uh, provides a tactful approach for everybody to really band together and understand that we're, we're all one. Um, there's certain people that don't act on those things as, as if we're one, but it's just one of those things that I know when it comes down to it, man, like I, my, everybody's days are numbered, you know what I mean? So it's like while yeah. we're here that we can get after it and really understand one another better, um, do it from a place of grace, do it from a place of love and really just, uh, you know, kind of bond together and keep getting after it. Ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. Bars. <laughs> <laughs> The bar. Um, thank all of you. Like I said, we could do this uh, for two hours. We do have another uh, panel that is going to come in uh, and really talk about it from the nuts and bolts end of, of the industry side. Um, but just so grateful for, for, for all of you. And needless to say, like, keep in touch. Let's let's let know that I'm, I'm always a resource. Um, we should all be, be there to rely on each other to expand, tell stories in whatever way necessary. 
Um, MFEB, looking forward to making moves with you uh, very soon. Um, but thank you guys so, so much for, for speaking your truth and speaking from the heart. And I, I know that the audience is very grateful uh, for your candor. We are going to, uh, to get these, these brothers off stage and we will bring in our next panel onto the stage. Uh, Steph White, uh, who opened us up at the beginning, is going to conduct uh, that panel. As uh, Steve LaRosier mentioned earlier, um, we do have the Stoke Pledge um, and the various ways that you can get involved uh, with Stoke, either as, a, a, as an igniter uh, someone who, who deals on a monthly basis decides, okay, this is the manner in which I'm going to contribute to Stoke. Um, we have various ways in which you could choose to sort of use uh, your, your, your resources, your circle, uh, your platforms to help uh, advance Stoke. Uh, and Steve, Steve and I will be talking a little bit more about that later. But we're going to take a little break um, so that we can shift these guys in and out, and then I will introduce our next panel. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Um, thank you for your patience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we are shuffling in our next panel. I have to say, like, the amount of uh, notes that I've been getting, text messages, DMs, uh, your responses and appreciation uh, for the manner in which uh, our first panel uh, showed themselves uh, is, is great. Someone just sent me a text that just said, I'm listening to this Stoke conversation. This is needed and should be monthly. Um, and that gives me goosebumps to know that people really want to be uh, in these conversations. And I hope that, that you all will continue uh, to have them amongst yourselves. But uh, next up, I'm going to introduce um, our panel uh, from the industry side, a bunch of people that I have an immense amount of respect for who are really, really, really doing um, the work, so to speak. Flash some cards and introduce you to them. I don't know if you can see the cards, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna roll yes, through. Um, okay, first up uh, is Luis Calderon. I've known um, Luis for oh my gosh, like 25 years. He is the founder of OKOK OK, OK Marketing and Creative. Uh, this man has done all of the work in and throughout uh, marketing in the snowboarding industry, uh, in music. Uh, he, is, he is the person who's the intersection of all the things that make uh, the culture whole. Uh, he's worked with Rock the Boat, did a bunch of work with Bernie Sanders, uh, as well as Burton Snowboards, where he is currently uh, advising and consulting in the bigger conversation of inclusion and diversity. Um, he is a G, one of my favorite human beings. Um, honored to have him. Uh, next up is Chris Baxter, skateboarder and co-founder of Stereo Skateboards. I've had the privilege of commentating skateboarding at various levels at X Games and with Red Bull. Uh, with Chris, he is uh, the ambassador of Stoke, a passionate artist who just loves and lives the essence uh, of skateboarding and a living legend. Stoked to have him uh, with us. Lindsay Orridge who is the founder of Driven by Diversity. She has spent uh, over two decades in and around the world of, uh, of racing um, and is really <clears throat> a genius in the space. Uh, she's worked in F1, MotoGP, NASCAR, Rallycross, Superbikes, uh, drifting. And um, she's really about having this long, larger conversation um, about diversity within the space and thus uh, founded Driven by Diversity. And last but not least is Justin Hoost, Wilkenfeld, um, he is a CEO and founder of Kind Humans, an incredible organization. Uh, I had the privilege of engaging in a historical paddle out in Encinitas in the wake of George Floyd that Justin helped uh, to organize. Um, he was an early uh, employee at, at GoPro, the fourth employee. Um, and since he uh, has left uh, GoPro, he is all about the nonprofit space. He is all about um, figuring out how to give and empower uh, larger uh, conversations about building um, a larger community uh, within our space. It is an honor uh, to have all of you uh, joining in this next, this next panel. And with that, I'm going to hand the reins over to, to Steph for this conversation. And just for you at home, uh, we are going to be running a little bit longer. Um, our apologies, but technical difficulties and a, a deep conversation 
it's uh, to be expected. Hope that you can stay with us. Steph? Cool. Thanks, Alema. Um, I think Lewis is having a little bit of, no, Lewis is here. Chris is having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, so we'll just be patient here while he's joining. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So I guess I wanna get this started with um, Lewis. So in the past few months, I feel like a lot of brands have been reaching out to you to help them craft their Black Lives Matter responses and show their support of the movement. Um, what has that process been like for you? And how, how did you become that person for so many brands? And what has that process been like for you? And anyone to chime in whenever as well. Thanks, Steph. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, it was, uh, I was at home watching like, uh, like everyone else watching the world change before our eyes, uh, feeling the, the pain, um, the horror, and, um, you know, really, really yet again, wondering, you know, how much longer do I, as a person of color in this country, as a, as a man, as a father, how, how much longer do I have to, uh, you know, accept watching this sort of stuff, you know, it happened years ago, uh, you know, it's, it's been happening for years and years and years. And, and, um, and so then all of a sudden I started to get phone calls and, um, and started to have conversations with my clients and, and, and former, uh, you know, coworkers. And I, as I said early on, uh, in those days, I was like, man, like, I, it, like it must be call your only black friend day because, um, you know, you guys are blowing me up. And, and to tr truth be told, at that time, I didn't really see what I could really contribute outside of just my honest and candid uh, point of view about how, what, how I felt. And if people wanted to get involved and become, you know, allies, white allies, like what they would, to what degree would those people and organizations be willing to do the work? And so in that process, I, I you know, where I, what I call this period is the intersection of consciousness and capitalism. And, um, you know, people and organizations are, are doing the work to various degrees, of, to, to various depths. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, the, the, one of the groups I'm working with uh, the most, Burton Snowboards, one of my oldest uh, relationships, and the company that brought me into the space where we're, we're really doing a lot of extensive soul searching, looking internally, and then taking steps to make sure that um, the, the, the culture looks different in the years to come. Yeah, totally. Um, do you, is there a point when, I just wanna add to this and again, anyone chime in, Chris, glad you're here. Um, was there a point for you where, um, is there conversations that people have where you decide that, okay, I'm not gonna engage in this or, or I am gonna engage in this? Like, I, I know that we talked a lot about this yesterday with all of us about tokenizing in the industry. So if Lewis or if anyone wants to add into that, at what point do you feel like you're just um, fulfilling a diversity quota? And what point do you feel like you're really being asked your, your genuine opinion and for feedback? I mean, I, I'll just, I'll add to that, that, you know, I'm at a point in my career and in uh, my journey in life at, um, I just celebrated my um, 46th birthday and, um, and, uh, and, and being, having been able to make a life out of uh, youth culture, uh, which has been a blessing. I am, however, at a point in this journey that where I, I just don't feel that I have to do anything I don't really want to do, thankfully. Right. So I, I just, um, if, if I don't believe that people are about about it, I'm just not gonna, you know, do it. I don't, you know, this, it was important to like, I work, I'm working directly with the owners and, uh, and this isn't like a, a, some sort of HR initiative or some sort of marketing promotion. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't like an email marketing campaign. I, I, I personally only wanna work with folks that are, are genuine about doing it. And, um, and so the, the, the process, you know, we, we, I'm able to ask them some serious questions. And if I feel that, you know, it's, um, it's legit, then we, then we go forward to do this, uh, this work. Um, but I just, I, you know, I refuse to participate in, um, in any sort of uh, token like activity at this point. You know, I, what I love about this period is 
is the liberation, the movement of the liberation of, uh, of people of color in this industry. It's, it's, it's our time to be able to voice our, our opinions and thoughts and feelings and, and platforms like this. And shout out to Stoke for always being so innovative, uh, uh, you know, is giving us that, that platform. Yeah, I'd like to add in. Um, I mean, it. I think part of this is like that knee jerk reaction that we see these days in social media and mainstream media. And there's this like whipsaw that happens where I feel like people jump on the bandwagon because it's like what you're supposed to do to fulfill your social media obligation, um, as opposed to really digging into understanding. And then from there, what's your long term goal and commitment to the change? Because these changes take decades to, to come to fruition quite often. And so we have to be willing to run the marathon. And so I think, you know, to Lewis's point, like when you talk to different organizations, I mean, that's part of the conversation is to really think beyond the, that instant gratification that we have come so accustomed to in this day and age. Um, and, you know, just like in sports, you, you have to fail or fall or, or maybe not even call it a fail. It's more of like you're learning lessons along the way. And those experiences are helping you grow and evolve. Uh, and it's constantly like that path is always forward like each day that we wake up is a new dawn and a new day um and there is no going back you know and, and we just keep getting back on the, the bike or on the board or what have you uh and charging forward but i'm just excited that we're having these conversations and as comfortable as they may be it's great that we're exposing this uh part of the industry and you know giving ourselves and the community an opportunity to to do something about it to, to help facilitate a positive change yeah and i actually had a question for you justin and it sort of ties to lindsay as well in this moment so justin you came from working in finance to so then working at this major company being one of the first employees at gopro um, to creating their gopro for a cause and really supporting their cause-based things and then now creating your own um your own company kind humans focused on specifically creating change and creating the, these just genuinely kind, good spaces. Um, so, and, and to that, Lindsay, I think also you saw, you have a background in motorsports and you saw that there was just a, this, this lack of, of diversity there and, and created driven by diversity. So I'm wondering for Justin, Lindsay, you guys can decide how to go, but at what point did it make more sense for you? At what point did, it benefit you to work within the industry? And then at what point did it make more sense for you to branch off and just say, you know what, I'm gonna do my own thing and then they can come back on if they want to. Go for it, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, Steph, um, I have 20 years of working in the motorsport industry and people that look like me are pointed to as diversity in our industry. So that kind of tells you pretty much everything you need to know about how diverse uh, motorsports isn't. Um, and I think one of the things that we're finding um, with talking to uh, the brands and the series that we're talking to currently is that it's only a really a recent thing that people have ever really discovered that they actually need to do something about. A lot of things in the last few years have been um, put into action for gender diversity. Um, that's partly because a law came into effect here in the UK where you had to publicly report what your gender pay gap was. Um, and because most of motorsport is sort of based here in the UK, a significant proportion of it anyway, then um, it kind of shamed people into having to do something about it. But it also um, highlighted the inequity when it came towards actually the people who were on track, let alone the people who are behind the scenes. It's about 5% women in motorsport. That's, that's it. Um, mm. And that's including people behind the scenes as well. And I think... We, we got to the point where it became, uh, the thing that I, I think people struggle to kind of comprehend is that we make champions in this industry, like Lewis Hamilton, um, and you know other non-black athletes as well, like amazing riders, amazing drivers. Um, and we're only fishing from a pool of 50% of the population as in male, and then only from the pool of men who are rich enough to race in motorsport and yet we can still find those incredible athletes so imagine if we widened that out and actually fished from the entire pool then i think we'd uh, you know we we would see just some even more incredible champions and that's what this industry thrives on and i think people have, have come to that quite late 
in this industry, I won't lie, action sports is light years ahead of motorsports. It really, really is. Um, really is because the additional barriers that we have in this industry are that um, in order to get involved in motorsports, if you want to compete in it, um, it's not just a case of going and picking up a football and kicking it about or um, picking up a skateboard and learning it. You can't really do it in urban areas. Um, you can't really do it unless you have a significant money behind you to even try it. You know, I'd really challenge anybody to give it a go and see how that goes on the first go um, yeah. and not be worried about whether you're going to smash a car up. So I think we got to the point where it was like, this can't be that I am the diverse, you know, sort of looking person in this industry. So I just thought, well, we'll do something about ourselves. And um, yeah, it's, uh, we've got a long way to go. But if one thing that this industry um, thrives on is um, incremental gains, we invest literally hundreds of millions of pounds per year in the potential of getting an extra thousandth of a second out of a car and a driver who's operating that car. Yeah. And the we, we thrive on good data, like decision quality information that has to be decided on in, within thousands of a second to make sure that it's going to win or, you know, something safe, more importantly, as well, which is an element that people, you know, seem to forget about a lot. And I think by diversifying the pool of um, information that you're drawing from the better decision quality information you're going to get at that time and that's something that should naturally appeal to this industry because we are such a data-based industry so that alone should be the argument regardless of the moral and ethical air, um, you know sort of reasons for doing it but that alone should be the inspiring idea around hey we might be able to make our cars go faster and break some yeah. records if we have better you know more diverse groups of people to actually make those uh, make those decisions yeah, and along that, I know, Justin, I know that I pulled you into this and I really want to talk about this with everyone, but I also want to acknowledge um, Chris is on here and Guys. similar to that, hey, Chris. <laughs> um, similar to that, um, you created Stereo Skateboards in 1992. So you've been in this industry for a long time, seeing some of the things that Lindsay and Lewis have been talking about. So what yeah. what did you believe was missing in the industry that that... Um, stereo was an answer to. So similar to what what um, Lindsay was saying, what did you see what was missing and, and is that still gap? missing? Yeah. yeah, you know, um, gosh, I got my first skateboard in 1979. It was one of those little plastic, we called them chicken sticks. Um, and then 1984, uh, I got the Powell Bones Brigade video show and a proper like Veriflex skateboard from my godbrother Rodney. And um, I got lucky because Rodney Smith, my godbrother, uh, founded Shut Skateboards, which later became Zoo York. And uh, this was basically my brother. You know, we we skated together every single day. And we pretty much lived together. So I was fortunate enough um, to have Rodney to identify with. If I didn't, I mean, there was no other black skaters. There was maybe a couple people I'd come in contact with from New York City. But um, it was predominantly, you know, 95% white or more. Um, and then I grew up in a up, middle upper class neighborhood, which was kind of similar, very few black people, very few Hispanics. And I, I remember being in the car with some of uh, my friends, you know, even though they were my friends, I, I cringed to call them that, but this was what happened. They would use the N word and then flip around and realize I was in the car and totally go white and just be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I used that word. You're, you're not one of them. That's mm -hmm. right. I'm not yeah. one of them. What, what is that supposed to mean? And they're like, well, you 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 get good grades and like, you don't, you're not in trouble. And I just was like, wow, <laughs> thanks for smacking my race upside the head, you know? Um, and I, I, I always identified as African-American because I was raised by two black women. My dad is, is Greek, but um, part of ways with my mom when I was seven. So I grew up with my godmom and, and, uh, my mom and my godbrother, and that was my family unit along with my godfather. And they're all African-American, so I always identified as black. Uh, in the skate industry, I've been told to try to reel it back before at times. Like, I have this board that's a blue note copy, and it says black note. And I use, you know, the raised fist emoji, for instance, on Instagram. And I've had meetings with people where they're like, hey, man, I think you should really kind of, like, reel back on that black stuff because it makes people uncomfortable. Yeah, wow. you know that's that's the uh, I would say the overwhelming um, feeling from the action sports community. It makes me uncomfortable. I, I so it's I'm colorblind. It it was like when Sal said someone on a wave said something really ignorant to him. You know, I hear it all the time in skateboarding. It's like, oh, we're we're colorblind. 
no, no one's colorblind. And to run through life ignoring race and ignoring your friend's race makes you pretty much a racist in my life because you're not been learning about uh, wrongs that have been done to black people in the past. And um, you're basically just trying to take the easiest way out by saying, hey, we're all rolling, right? We're all cruising. Um, so I'm, I'm not down with that. I think we, we deserve to talk about everyone's race, everyone's culture, everyone's sex. Uh, where are you from is hugely important. We celebrate Irish heritage. We celebrate German heritage. And we damn well better celebrate black heritage. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, that's yeah. my intro. Sorry, I had to move mid uh, <laughs> mid segment. We have some it's part, it's part of it. So, the day, it's the day we're yeah, having. I had to hustle down here to my <laughs> office. So thank you for having me, and uh, I'll start there. Of course. Um, I so well, we. I, I think you hit on something, Chris. Sorry, it's uh, you hit on something that that reminded me of something Craig said yesterday. Yeah. Which is you know about the melting pot. And there's this whole idea of like not wanting to, it's like, if you look at it like a melting pot and I use this term all the time, you don't really know what you have, right? It's just like, it all becomes this like one color, whatever, right? (laughs) But he's like, you know, a better metaphor might be thinking of it like a salad. And you have all these like beautiful colors and, you know, different types of things that you can put together and mix and match and, you know, add to it, take away. And then like when you combine some like flavors, you're going to get this awesome taste. Um, So I I love that because it's a celebration of the diversity and thinking about like each thing is still its own thing, you know? So I love that. that uh, Thrasher magazine just did a sort of black issue and it was a front and back cover. And there was like 32 African-American pro skaters, which I was like, wow, it's, we've come a long way. You know, when I started, there was pretty much zero. It was Marty Grimes, who I was re- aware of. Um, it was my brother who was sponsored. And then Ray Barbie came just before me and you know, kind of set the stage and the tone. And I was drawing his graphic logo on my notepad in high school, being like, man, if Ray can do this, I can do this. Um, also Ron Allen, another African-American skater, but there was very few of us. I mean, it was like a handful. You couldn't pull together 35 some odd black skaters in the eighties, period. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Big shout to your, to your brother, man. To a big, big shout to Rodney. Rodney's a, a pioneer. He's up yeah, here. He spent, he spent some time up here in Vermont. I mean, it's like, this is all about mentoring, right? And I was no lucky enough to have Rodney Smith and Mike Vallely pick me in New Jersey and just like hone me in, you know, and thank goodness. Cause I, I, you know, met Mike when I was like 14 and I was so impressionable, but he, you know, he didn't party. He was on it. He ripped, um, you know, and, and we had our own little click. And then Rodney was like fast. He was like fashion forward with art and music. He knew everything like Devo ripped up Levi's flannels. Like he was three steps ahead of every fashion statement, every band. So, um, Luckily, I got I got handed culture to me from my brother. Yeah, well, I mean, but the, the thing about that is that is that you know what Rodney is and was then was culture. You know, totally. we, I don't think we he, we knew how to define it as such then. Style, you know? yeah. He 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 was culture. So I think I think that like skateboarding, BMX, some of the more I mean, again, like skateboarding's real boom where it becomes a lot more inclusive after after your class of, of, of pioneering is around, you know, early 2000s, you know what I mean? All that whole generation of skaters, musicians, you know, Pharrell comes in, yeah. is talking about skateboarding, he's on the cover of Fader Magazine, boom, culture and skate intersect again and just spark this whole other category. I think skate, I think BMX, um, have always been a couple of the action sports that have been, you know, more inclusive. It's been easier for people to come to it and participate. The family, the community just welcomes people in with a lot less uh, resistance yeah. than some of the other activities, other sports yeah. that require like thousands of dollars to just show up to day one. You know, like yeah. skiing is... Uh, you know, you have to have some money. Snowboarding, you have to have money. Surfing, you need to be by the ocean. Everybody's got a curb to grind, you know, um, and and that makes it a lot easier to get into it. For sure, 100%. And, you know, skateboarding thrives in cities, you know, places like New York City where it's just streets or your canvas. So, you know, anyone can do it with a skateboard and, 
you know, I've seen places like in New York and SF will go rob you for a board if they have to, but you know, it's right there. It's on the streets. Um, yeah, and, and everybody. I, I just want to acknowledge also I'm we're gonna we are over time and we're gonna continue being a little bit over time um, because there's so much to say and we've had a little bit of delays here. So anyone who's watching, if you have time, stay on for a bit. Um, we're gonna sound for a little bit. And I just wanted to to direct the conversation, make sure that everyone has a chance to speak on this last thing. And I think it'll continue to be more of a conversation. So it doesn't have to be your last notes necessarily, but we'll still spend another five-ish minutes on this. But in line with what you guys are talking about right now, what what would you say are the keys to authentically supporting people of color in this movement right now? So what for brand for brands and the industry people who are trying to authentically support people, I know that Chris, you just mentioned mentoring and, and Lewis were talking a lot about like culture, like the cultural significance of authentic, uh, of what that support can look like. Um, if we just want to spend the last few minutes directing the conversations around how can, how can we authentically support people of color in this movement and in this industry right now? Well, I'll, I'll chime in. I mean, I think that part of this is just, um, really taking time to learn, right. And to yes. try to do our best to integrate people into our lives that can share perspectives and their experiences to help shape ours as we shape our businesses or shape our personal lives even or how we interact with other people. Uh, so we've made a commitment um, just as a business and this was kind of since day one uh, and some legacies back to GoPro, but GoPro is a, a tool for a lot of affluent people. Uh, in order to use a GoPro, you obviously need to be able to afford it. Um, it's, it's not beyond reach for a lot of people, but in order to go do the experiences that you're gonna to wanna to capture on a GoPro, more than likely you, you have some money. Um, and if you look at the demographic of those people, it's definitely trends towards lighter colors of skin. Um, yeah. I think that combined with just access and in general, just like access to you know, funding, um, and that is kind of a colorblind thing at the end of the day. But if you look at the, the tendencies over time in this country, it, it definitely trends towards people of color. Um, there's no doubt about that. And so we're trying to, you know, do things like support programs like Stoked. And we've been working with Stoked since the GoPro days. But um, I love starting with kids. I love starting with education and mentoring and coaching and exposing them to good, good role models. And so a big part of what we're trying to do is as a platform by humans is to elevate the positive role models in society and to show that diversity of culture and to show people in places of success and to let that those people lead by example uh, and, and show the way. And so I feel like the landscape of content in the world needs to change. And so a big part of what we're trying to do is help change that narrative towards a more positive, towards a more diverse culture. And yeah. I, I think it's all about culture. I mean, I think that if we really boil things down, I mean, the system is a reflection of our culture. And so if we really want to attack that, we really got to start with kids and exposing them to enough things so that they're not living in these little bubbles and that they have that empathy towards others. So I'm excited that, that this is all like the Band-Aid's kind of been ripped off, I feel like recently and the fact that we're all here having this conversation is a testament uh to progress yes yeah. and uh steph i'll pick up I, I feel it's you know what can people do is make sure that they're listening actually open their ears and trying to understand each other and understand you know i came from the port of new orleans and i and then my family moved to tulsa oklahoma and then newark new jersey and i have my own story and to not dismiss each person's story, to actually listen, um, to be open to change and growth, because you know, not all of us have life figured out. And, uh, and then thirdly, uh, to empower those people of color, color and the youth to make some change and to like maybe, maybe vote someone in if, they're, if you have no black people in your office. Uh, I, I did a, a similar discussion with a huge company, I've done multiples. And you look out and it's like, you know, there's like three black people for every 500 
tons of people are kind of you know, participants in the sport. Um, so it's we've got a long way to go, but um, I feel confident that you know it's, it's in good hands. People so like so so these conversations are happening. Um, and yeah, we just got to continue to try to understand each other and empower each other, basically. Is there a phone call happening? Yeah, I was gonna say if someone wants, if everyone wants to go on mute, if anyone is, whoever is not, <laughs> whoever is not talking, if you want to go on mute real quick, someone's on a phone call. Um, Louis, do you want to come in? Yeah, I'll hop on. Um, I mean, you know, look, I, I, I am um, so honored to be part of this conversation today. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I've, I've, I've seen, I love Stoked. I have always seen myself as a stoked kid. You know, my own story was when I moved, my, my parents were from Cuba. I was the first person in my family born in the United States. I lived in Miami. My parents split. I moved up to Burlington, Vermont, the whitest state in the country uh, in the mid eighties. I felt like the only, uh, you know, I was definitely the only in many, many rooms. I met a bunch of kids who skated. We love Public Enemy, NWA. They introduced me to two guys, two white guys, Manny and Jack Hoglin, who taught me how to snowboard. And uh, out of teaching me how to snowboard, I learned the values that many young uh, people gain out of an organization like Stoked and how to, you know, how to face your fears, how to persevere. And in that process, I, I found my tribe. And, um, and so, from that point, I was able to get, you know, uh, fast forward through things, but I ended up getting a career and I've been able to have generational change. So yeah. I, I see myself as the end product of, of what Stoke, Stoke organizations like Stoke do. And so that's why I'm so, um, so proud of Stoke. And, 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 and uh, you know, I'm using this day, this opportunity to, to reaffirm um, my, the Stoke pledge um, in the years past, Salema and Steve have at, you know, tapped me in to run the New York City Marathon on behalf of Stoked. I ran it twice. You know, my, my life has changed because of organizations like this, you know. And, um, and so I, think, I look at the bigger picture. I look at the journey line from, from, you know, kids, young people that need to be brought in and what people gain out of exposure, mm -hmm. participation, the relationships that develop, everything that I feel happens at like level one, I think is in, so important to consider because without that, you know, people opening the door and inviting people into the table, uh, into the room to sit at the table, there, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't grow and it doesn't evolve. Yeah. My big play, however, is to get past that. And, and I'm about what I call the big E, and it's not, to me, it's not equality. It's at this point in time about equity. I'm all about the big E, equity. And so what does that look like for these organizations and these businesses that are on this call today? You know, when you look around and you, you say to yourselves, we have a great diverse workforce. I mean, are we really like, let's, you know, be willing to break down what diversity really means. If you remove gender and if you remove orientation, when we specifically talk about BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, in your organization, how many of those people outside of retail or in the warehouse or at the shop, how many of those people are sitting at the table in, in management? How many of those people are in a, uh, have an opportunity to make real uh, business decisions. How many people like us um, are in your C-suite? Um, so my challenge to this entire industry, because of this time, because of the murder of George Floyd, which is the only reason we are all here today, I implore everyone to look inside themselves and their organizations and ask themselves, what are they doing to bolster and support equity from 2020 and into the future. Mic drop. <laughs> Except picking up the mic because Lindsay, last words. <laughs> oh, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> um, I think if I could sort of leave one sort of final thing from an industry point of view and to brands that are listening to this is that 
everybody likes to talk about their company culture and the family environment and all those sorts of things and how they, you know, how they want to live so that the people who work for them and the people that buy their products or services or look at them from the outside see who they are. And I think when you really boil it down, like culture is really what you're willing to tolerate like that really sets the tone for the culture of your company. It's not about what you want to do or what your expectations are. It's about what you're actually willing to tolerate. So if you expect people to turn up on time and they don't, well, you're tolerating people not turning up on time. And I think it's no different for this sort of conversation around equity, equality, diversity, whether it's due to race or any part of um, sort of diversity. It's if you do not make a statement and you do not make any moves to actually take action, that's you tolerating a, a, an unpleasant and an, a really, you know, sort of unnecessary thing that does not need to be tolerated anymore. So, you know, what you're willing to tolerate sets the real tone for your company culture. And if you want that to be out there as your company culture, that you tolerate people being treated in ways that are utterly inhumane, then your uh, <laughs> shares will no doubt and your profits will no doubt uh, eventually show in that. Yeah. I think I think that was an adequate second mic drop, Lindsay. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lewis, Chris, Justin, Lindsay, so much for having this conversation. I appreciate everyone being patient with the technical difficulties here. And I do want to say that, hey, Chris's friend. Um, yeah. oh boy. <laughs> I do want to acknowledge that th there. This is. Salema and I's goal of this conversation was to crack the surface on these issues. And I don't even know if we did that. I think we, we made like a hairline fracture and there's so much more to say. And so with you four, with the eight panelists today, with everyone in this community, these conversations are going to continue all the time. Um, with Stokes, we have a lot of things in store of ways to carry on this conversation. And I'm going to let Steve and Salema end that. But thank you so much, the four of you, for being here. And being patient and, and doing the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. guys. Salama, Steve, all you. Yeah. Steve, you there, buddy? Oh, oh, not here on mute. Hello, hello, oh, hello. Okay, hello. guys. There I am go. here. I am here. <laughs> hey. Um, man, that was that was vibey. Yeah, that was um, both those conversations could have easily gone for 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 hours. I love uh, what 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 Lewis said about um, about really you know brands being willing to put their money where their mouth is as far as what their their infrastructure looks like. You know, at a C suite level, sharing power. You know, equality is nice, equity is better, and I think in our yeah. future conversations, you know, we, we will really be able to get into the nitty gritty of inclusion. You know, and looking at the definition of the word inclusion, meaning everybody being included. Um, but yeah, this was beyond what I could have imagined. And Steph, thank you so much for being such a such a star and a light in, um, in guiding that conversation. Yeah, Appreciate and even that, uh, yeah, and so um, Steph, yeah, thank you for you know for just kind of uh, just helping to spark the voice this conversation months ago. Um, and leading a training for our uh, for our mentors and our community, which kind of you know morphed into a, a need. And so um, this event would not have been possible, um, you know, without the hard work of uh, Steph, uh, Alyssa Ronick. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you so much, Steph. Thank you so much, Jen. Which the seed of this kind of came, this event came from Jen. Um, thank you for. Uh, I think you guys could tell that this was not a normal Zoom call, right? <laughs> this was, it looked really good and professional, um, and it looked like a game show or a video game, um, and that's all due to race service. Um, you know, Ryan, Jacob, Carlos, thank you so much for putting your time and your effort into making this a really, really beautiful uh, presentation. And uh, you know, we, we have we have hiccups, but we like in action sports, you fall down, you get back up. And, and uh, we've, I think at one point had 300 plus people on this. I really can't believe it um, that we had that many people on this call. Um, there's a, I wanna give special thanks. There's a lot of people here. Thank you to all of 
uh, the speakers. Um, thank you to all of our partners that helped share this. Um, you know, Group Y uh, vans send this to their whole entire company, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, uh, my team internally at Stoked, um, Art, Abba, um, thank you to uh, Andrew, James, um, Jay. Um, this, this, if you've been following Stoked for a while, um, you know that, um, that, that COVID really is affecting us, uh, like many nonprofits, like we can't do the thing that we had set out to do, um, and that we were birthed to do because of COVID. Um, but so we are reinventing ourselves and we are, uh, bringing to the forefront the, the, the work that we're doing in an intentional manner. We have been doing the work of of you know dismantling uh, racial injustice and providing opportunities for black and brown youth for 15 years in action sports. Um, and I'm very, very um, just, I'm just really, really grateful. Thank you to everybody on here. There's a lot, speakers, everybody. Um, and uh, so the last thing is, is, you know, again, we don't want this to be a Zoom call where you feel good and you like you maybe you got an idea. There's there's an actual plan that we have in order to really address like changing the culture of action sports and um, and it's the Stoke Pledge and and uh, you know I've been getting a lot of texts, again, a lot of messages, and I'm sure everybody else has. Um, there's a there's we could do more. We can have not just more conversations, but there's an actual way to do this. And if one is uh, to be an igniter. So you go to stoke.org slash pledge, uh, you can sign up, um, you could become an igniter. An igniter, and by, by the, there's a lot of people in the industry, there's, uh, there's about 300 people that donate monthly or yearly to support our work, right? Um, the second thing is, uh, and you can donate you know, any amount, but it, it, that, that's like, the intentionality of, of supporting a cause like Stoked um, and, and putting your money towards people that are providing opportunities for black and brown youth in this industry uh, uh, across the country, like this is a, an actual thing that you can affect changes. You don't have to be out protesting, you can protest with your dollar as well, right? The second thing is to be an ally. Um, you know, you can become a mentor, you could share your skills, uh, your expertise, you know, to our youth, we are planning to launch a an online mentoring program this fall. We need a lot of mentors. We just got a grant, an opportunity to to grow to grow an online. So we want to distinctly change kids' life trajectories in even more of a way uh, than we have been before by aligning them. So you could be a mentor. You're in California, mentor a kid in your community. Um, through through stoked um and you know i know that we've had a lot of athletes we have a lot of brands on here um and uh and and yeah you can be an ambassador uh you can you can share our message you can tag us like if you share your message with uh your followers share a message with your followers you can tremendously help you know increase our impact you know, we we just collaborated with Autotype Design and Aliasha, and um, they created a T-shirt. They spread it out to their network. We had almost eight thousand dollars in two weeks just for a simple posting. Right? They, imagine the impact that if you have a large following, that what you could do for us. Um, and the the next thing is, uh, you know, download your support package. You guys going to get an email. There's going to be a toolkit on what you can do. We're also going to send out the replay for this so you can just continue to plug in. There's a lot of really amazing deep things that people have said um, in order to, uh, to do it, to, to, to rich, you know, stories that you can sort of get lessons from and really take to heart, you know, to what the speaker said. And just, again, spread everything on, on uh, that. And so, like, to go back to the Stoke Pledge, I, uh, I just got word Salema and we can, you know, announce it um, that, you know, our first major commitment pledge is with powder. And so they, uh, the details will come out and, you know, quote unquote, watch this space, but uh, so proud that we're going to be partnering with powder 
for the next couple of years to legit change the trajectory of kids in through their resorts and through their brands. And um, I'm, I'm honored um, that they're working with us, but I'm even more excited for just the idea and the notion that a kid in Stoked could end up being a teacher or a snowboard instructor at a mountain, right? And just imagine the life trajectory of that young person and everybody that they interact with on uh, at the resort level, right? The narrative, the landscape, the context has changed, right? And so that's that's the level of vision. And so that they're they're going to be they're our first stoked equity partner. It's not about equality; it's about equity, right? As Lewis said, and we've been hey, Steve. We've, this. Yeah, go ahead. What's up? High, high, high five for, oh, for high let's five. just high five this moment yes. because we yes. put in we we put in we put in some some, some work on this absolutely and I'm <laughs> I'm very proud I'm honored and 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 just so if you're a brand on here and you want to make change true change and help with the long term trajectory this is like you know institutional racism has been 400 years you're not going to solve it with a seasonal campaign. This is a multi-year long-term project, right? This is an initiative that, that weaves in every part of your organization. So anyway, I'm, uh, I'm proud of, thank you so much, Powder. Um, again, watch this space. Um, and then I think that's, uh, that's it. What's, uh, what's the next slide? I think we're gonna have a video. Salam, any uh, last bit of parting words? Oh man, I'm just, um, I'm just, I'm just geeking off of the fact that that we closed the powder deal. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I should also, I, mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I should also say that even before powder, I'd like to acknowledge Justin and Kind Humans for making a long-term commitment to working with us. Uh, if you go to kindhumans.com, uh, they're where their youth partner. Um, we have a slew of uh, different campaigns over the next uh, the next year. Uh, a percentage of sales go to us, um, um, and then you know we're just coming up with more ways that we could provide opportunities for our kids, uh, fund stoked, and just diversify. So thank you to Justin and his amazing team, and for find, not just giving us a platform, but just giving us money and to to be able to 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 do this work. So thank you. Yeah, and I just well, I'll follow that up with saying, like at, at the beginning of this conversation, we I spoke about we spoke about how this can making making this a lifestyle, making it a lifestyle for you personally, um, and, and one that you continue to grow in, like anything else you love, and how to make it a part of uh, your DNA at a brand level. And these two examples, you know, the work that we're doing with with kind humans, uh, the support we've gotten from Vans. Um, and, and this huge sort of unprecedented initiative with powder, these are brands committing and saying, this is not something we want to do for a moment in order to catch shine. This is, this is the type of work that we want. We want it to be as recognizable uh, as anything else that, um, people are drawn to our brand about. So, you know, when I think about the 15 years that we've been doing this work since Steve, uh, and I started stoked, uh, over a phone call and on my couch um to be having and then arriving at this moment is exciting and you know whether or not it's stoked that you choose uh to work with please look at these these as examples and look at your platform look at what your tool what's in your toolbox what do you have to give who can you partner with um at a local level and larger um to just take the tools that you already have you don't have to reinvent yourself it's just figuring out what those partnerships look like, who can you align with to lend what you have to give and really make, make it, make it, make it, think of it in the same way that you, that you do when, when collabing to produce product. Um, these are collaborations and it, it, it's, it's not uh, charity. And if you think of it from a collaborative perspective, uh, we really have the potential to, to literally like make, make this landscape something that looks completely different over the course of the next decade. And that's that for me. And guys, I'm going to, it's Steph again. Hey, I'm hopping on as a ghost voice to remind you guys that there is a video at the end of this uh, as an example. Oh, I'm not a ghost anymore. Um, we're going to show a video to end this um, webinar. 
that is an example of what the Stokes Pledge is and what people have done already for everyone to get an idea of what how they can just start to get involved and how they can start to share that with their social media. So with that toolkit that Steve mentioned, you'll get um, graphics and they're on the Stokes Org page. Um, so you can tell your audiences and tell everyone that you are a Stokes ambassador or igniter or ally. And then if you could post a video like one of the ones that's gonna be here in a second, um, we can get this movement going. Thank you so much, Lama. Thank you, Steve. Now a mystery video, maybe? Yeah. Oh, or just Ethan Carter. And I pledge to become a Stoked Ally and Thank Ambassador. To join the Stoked Pledge by donating decks to the Stoked Mentoring Organization. I took the pledge. I took the pledge. We took the pledge! We want equality so that all can be stoked. Yeah. Now it's your turn. Now it's Ethan Color. And I pledge to become a Stoked ally and ambassador. To join the Stoked Pledge by donating decks to the Stoked Mentoring Organization. I took the pledge. I took the pledge. We took the pledge! Hey, we want equality so that all can be Stoked. <laughs> Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn! Join us. And I hope that you'll join us in the support store. Go to stoked.org to make the pledge. Create a video, and it's time to share.